Hi everyone, welcome to the Will and Spinning Podcast. My name is Rachel and I can be found pretty much everywhere as Welford Pearls. This is episode 18. It is the beginning of March 2016. I'm coming to you from just outside of Vancouver, British Columbia and yeah, the house is quiet. It's a Sunday here. Um, I think it's March 6th, I think. <laughs> this will be coming out live um, later in the week. Um, my husband took the two kids to the park um, to get them outside before it's going to start raining. It's really gray outside. The, the clouds are low. Um, it was bright this morning and there was some blue sky, but it seems to have kind of gone now. And they are saying rain by 10 o'clock. So anyways, I hope they have fun and they can get home before it gets too wet. And I can record before they get home. <laughs> While I was setting up my equipment this morning, I actually had several thoughts. I was thinking, when was the last time I recorded? And then I you know, was carrying on and collecting everything and I was like, it feels like a really long time since I recorded. I continued to collect things and I was like, no, it's been a long time. <laughs> I feel like I haven't talked to you guys for a very long time. So welcome and I hope that um, you're all doing very well and that you're spinning lots. I haven't spun barely anything. I do have one finished skein to show you. I have been knitting like the wind. Um, I cast off four shawls in February, which is, I think that's got to be a new record for me. I have never even knit four sweaters in a, in a month. And so to make four shawls is pretty amazing. Um, two of them were out of my hand spun. So I have those to show you uh, today. And two of them were for yarn reviews and they're done. And actually one of them I gifted to my mom and one of them um, I've been wearing and actually I've, I I love it. I'm surprised um, how much wear it's already gotten. And it's only been off the needles for a week. So that's kind of neat. I will link to those in the show notes if you're curious about those yarn reviews and you want to see the blog posts that go with them. Because um, of course they're not hand spun so I'm not going to talk about them on the show. Um, today we have some housekeeping that we need to cover. I have some finished knitted hand spun, which I just mentioned. I do have one finished spin and some plans for it that I'm going to uh, show you. I have one project on the wheel, um, which I'll just show you as an update more than anything. And I am going to, I need to start the Sweet George Yarns Fiber Club, um, today actually. I haven't started it yet, which is really unusual for me, but um, I picked it up at the studio on Thursday night after um, Misty actually had it waiting for me there at the studio when I got there for um, teaching for the evening. And I, the colors this month could not be more perfect for me. Um, so I'm really looking forward to spinning it, but um, I need to get going because uh, it's going to be, it's going to take a long time. February was a nice break with singles and now um, I'm back to doing something a little bit finer. So I need to get it going. Um, and then we're gonna do a special section at the end today. We are gonna talk a little bit about fiber tools. I've had quite a number of questions about it. And then um, I had one sort of more specific question. Somebody really um, wanting some information about sort of all the fiber tools that are out there and if I could speak to them and what I have enjoyed about my tools that I have. So that will be at the end of the show. And if you're not interested in um, hearing more about fiber tools, you're already proficient with your fiber tools and you're happy um, with what you've got, um, you can just say goodbye a little bit early. So we are gonna start off with some housekeeping. I have two pattern giveaways to do today. Um, I kind of, I was gonna wait a little bit longer before I did them, but I feel like it's March now and we are slogging away on the spinning and possibly getting into some of the knitting of our Zero to Hero spackle that's going on in the Ravelry group and people have been chatting it up and really supporting each other and there's been a lot of um, just really positive, you know, you can do it and that's beautiful and I love what you did there and just really, really supportive and I wanted to... Um, just acknowledge that and do a little bit of a giveaway. I also wanted to give away one of Nina's patterns today. She is at um, N La Fontaine on Instagram and she has fuzzy love knots on Ravelry. Sort of a, just to get a feel of her patterns, I thought that I would show them to you. If your name is drawn from the what do you spin in the summer giveaway thread in the Ravelry group, um, you can choose one of her five patterns. Let me know which one you choose 
and then um, I will let Nina know and she will gift that to you. Um, so like I said, she's Fuzzy Love Knots on Ravelry and have a look at her patterns. Choose one if your name is drawn and um, yeah, let me know what uh, you choose. So let's do that first. I already did the random number generator. So um, I then um, it was actually a lot of people entered. Um, it was three to 36 that I entered into the random number um, random.org. I have two more of Nina's patterns to give away after this and so do keep your ideas and comments about summer spinning coming. If you have already entered once about your ideas for spinning in the summer, now that we've drawn the first giveaway, you can go ahead and enter again and I will continue um, drawing from three to whatever the new number is. So um, if you've already shared what your thoughts about spinning are, go ahead and um, um, enter some more and I'm actually going to take the chatter free um, label off of the thread and you can um, just chatter with one another about summer spinning because um, I wanted the first one to be sort of a true giveaway and then after that we'll do kind of a chatter giveaway so if you um, because there's a lot of people that don't live in really super hot summery places and I thought you know for those of us like myself I, my my projects don't change a lot in the summer um, but for those of you living in hotter places, it's sort of an interesting time. Like it, it would be neat to hear some more from all of you about sort of how things change in the summer, kids being on summer vacation, you having vacation, maybe being, being away camping, that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, so the winner was number 17 and that is Sharby, um, which is Sharon Ann and she is actually a fellow Canadian. She is in Newfoundland, Canada. So, uh, Sharon, if you, Sharon Ann, if you could get in touch with me, let me know which of Nina's patterns you would like um, to be gifted and I will get Nina to do that. Congratulations, Sharon. And um, the other giveaway was a morale booster for the spackle, the Zero to Hero spackle. There's been a lot of chatter, like I said. Um, there has been, when I say a lot of chatter, like we're already up to post number 252 as of recording right now. Um, so there was a lot to um, throw into random.org. And um, this is a morale booster that is a gift. It's a pay it forward from Maya. Um, she won the, what did you win Maya? Oh my goodness gracious, I mailed you something. <laughs> I think you won some fiber from Smith in you. That's what you won. Um, so she offered to pay it forward um, because she she actually, she was really kind. Um, she said that she knows that shipping from Canada can be quite high and she wanted to either pay me for the shipping um, because she knew that um, that was coming out of my pocket or she wanted to pay it forward and I thought it was wonderful to be able to pay it forward. So Maya, thank you, that is very kind. And she's been very active in the um, Zero to Heroes spackle, so I thought we could pay it forward in there. So out of 252 entries, number 223 is the winner, and that is CPHT Crocheist, which is Jennifer from New Jersey. So congratulations, Jennifer. Um, if you could let me know um, what pattern on Ravelry, it can be any pattern you want, up to $10 US. Um, if you could let me know what pattern you would like, I will get Maya to gift that to you. So congratulations to Jennifer and Sharon Ann. We are going to have a big giveaway in the group and there's going to be a bit of crinkling. I'm going to mute the mic while I'm doing it because it's, it's really loud. So Euclid gifted a five sample bottles of Euclid. Included in this is eucalyptus, lavender, grapefruit, unscented, which is the natural one. And it kind of, I like that one because it leaves the sheepy quote unquote smell in the, um, in your knit. So like when you wash them, they come out just kind of, they're, they sort of smell the way they smelled before they went in, um, unless there was a lot of lanolin. And then in that case, like um, if you washed it in hot water and dissolved the lanolin and it came out, I'm talking about hand spun here, um, then that is gone. Cause you know how lanolin has a little bit of a scent, so that'll be gone. But then the natural is just leaves it smelling 
sort of with not, no scent other than just the wool smell. Um, so unscented in jasmine. And actually, they, so they put on there that there's the unscented, okay, there's grapefruit, lavender, eucalyptus, natural and scented. There's five in here. Which one's missing? Because they put the rapture in. I think the rapture is the jasmine one, actually. So, I mean, you get a really nice smattering of, of um, scents. Um, Euclid comes is Canadian. It's eco-friendly. It's an alternative to dry cleaning. It has no optical brighteners like a lot of commercial laundry soaps do that uh, promise brighter whites and brighter colored clothing. Um, it, the bottles are recyclable, phosphate-free, biodegradable, and non-toxic, um, which is actually why I like it. So these are 100 ml bottles. These are 100 ml bottles or 3.3 ounces for those of you in, this, in the States. Um, this is heavy and it's gonna cost a lot for me to ship it no matter where it goes, whether it stays in Canada or whether it goes overseas or down to the US, it's gonna cost quite a bit to send this. So, which I don't mind. I'm not, I'm not saying that because I mind. Um, I don't mind at all. But we're gonna have quite an extensive giveaway. So um, I'm gonna start a thread in the Ravelry group. And like I said, there will be a blog post as well um, to enter. So it's gonna be chatter. It's gonna be a chatter thread. Um, what we are gonna chat about, and I th I'm really hoping that what we end up doing is generating um, a bunch of ideas of, of how we wash our knits, how we wash our hand spun yarns, um, how we scour fleece, how we wash fleece. So if it's already been scoured and now we just need to wash it, um, how you wash your, uh, fiber or your hand spun after you've dyed it. So anything to do with washing and fiber, um, is, that's what I would like you guys to share. How do you do that? If you dye, um, Say you've just naturally dyed a whole bunch of Cheviot, because I know that's something that me and a couple of other people in the hand spun socks group um, have done. After you've dyed it, how do you get, how do you rinse it? How do you get it clean? How do you wash it? There's a little flex of matter and stuff in there. How do you get that clean? That would be an example. Um, so share your successes, share your pitfalls, your tips, your tricks. And like I said, chatter away. So the more chatter, the more talk that there is about how you launder your um, wool and your knits and whatnot, the higher chance you have of winning this. This is gonna be ongoing for a few months because I think it's gonna take a while for us to actually generate um, a, a, an, an enough resources for us to have something to draw on. If you were ever looking for something about something specific and actually my hope is that by the end um, when we do the actual giveaway that it will be an ongoing thread but I'm actually going to go through in the summer sometime and I'm going to um, pull out all of the tips tricks resources um, any links that you guys post to good resources that you've used in the past for cleaning and laundering and getting your stuff clean any blocking tips um, well, blocking's not really washing, so but if that's in there, that's great. Um, yeah, anything that you guys um, share in terms of wisdom and knowledge and passing on um, information about how you wash your things, um, your wool basically, and your fleece and your fiber, um, I'm gonna create on the a separate page on the Ravelry group, sort of a list of all of that stuff and um, have it organized so that if you're wondering about stuff, you can click on that page in the Ravelry group and you can look and have a quick look at, I wanna scour fleece, what are some tips that people have shared over in that thread rather than having to scroll through all the chatter as well. I hope that makes sense. Um, but I'm gonna get that thread started today and it will be there and you guys can start um, getting that going. And I will draw, I will do this drawing, I'm thinking sometime in June. Uh, maybe, um, yeah, either the, yeah, sometime in June. I'm not, I'm not totally sure about that when, when exactly, because I don't know how the episodes are going to fall, 
but sometime in June. So you've got lots of time. That's it for housekeeping. That took a long time. I'm really sorry. Um, I didn't mean for it to take so long, but it's actually a lot to explain. Hand spun knitting, what I have finished. I have two shawls to show you. Um, I am going to pause here. I'm going to throw in a bunch of photos and um, of the one and show you where the yarn, what it started as this fiber, what the yarn looked like, and then what the finished object looked like, and then I'll chat about it a little bit. Okay, so um, as you probably noticed, um, if you watched any of the February, the last episode actually, which was episode 17, and if you saw um, February's episode, um, you will recognize that this was February's Fiber Club. I didn't keep it skeined for long and I didn't, um, I, I knit with it right away. I was, these aren't really my colors. Um, coral and pink and whatnot I I really appreciate them but they're not my colors per se I don't wear them um, and I just felt really inspired um, to use the yarn right away see how it knit up it was such a like out of my comfort zone I haven't woven in the ends yet um, out of my comfort zone kind of a knit a spin because of the singles and it was super wash and blah 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 um, that I kind of, I think I just really wanted to see how the yarn would act being knit. Um, I will say there is no way that I can knit, rip this shawl out and keep the yarn intact. Like when I was blocking it, I blocked it to within one, like an inch of its life. Um, I used blocking wires and I um, I really, really stretched it and I did it when the kids were napping one afternoon and my mom was coming. So if they woke up, she was going to look after them because I knew it would take me a few minutes. And um, it, I just like really pulled it out to the edges of its sort of life, if you will. And the finished product, sorry, excuse me, the chair is just awesome. Like I, I, I love it. Um, Sorry, the end isn't woven in yet. It's technically not done. Jenny of the tiny paper foxes would say that this is not done. Um, so this is what it looks like when it's on. And it, um, this is sort of like how I would wear it. Um, I, it's really soft. Um, the other way that I would wear it probably is, um, sort of off to the side if I wasn't wearing a jacket. So that's what it would look like. Um, yeah, it's just, it's really pretty. It's really pretty. Um, up close so you can get an idea. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, the slip stitches I came up with on my own, I sort of, um, charted out um, a graph and figured out how many increases I would need to do, um, how many times I would need to increase, so how many rows I would need to increase before doing another slip stitch. And that worked really, really well because I feel like it really shows off the yarn and then the garter stitch in between. It's still striped, obviously, like from a distance, it looks like a striping, a self-striping yarn. But up close, it's, it's pretty and it shows off the the yarn and then the border is um, I did three garter stitch ridges so um, those are them there and uh, yeah it's very loose cast off I did a stretchy bind off um, so knit into the first stitch knit into the second stitch and then um, knit the two stitches past the two stitches back to the left needle, knit through the back loop, knit the next stitch, 
pass the two stitches back to the left needle, knit through the back loop. So that's how I got such a stretchy bind off. Um, I do that for my socks too, actually. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, what's it called? Jenny's stretchy bind off. I don't like the yarn overs. I can't knit tight enough to keep the yarn overs tight enough. Anyways, um, it turned out really nicely and um, it's quite big. So this actually isn't for me. Um, I knit, like I said, I knit four shawls in February. <laughs> Two of them were not for me. So this is not for me. And um, I gifted the one that was for my mom already to my mom. This is actually for Nora. So I have washed it, I've blocked it. I will weave in the ends before I put it away, but I'm actually gonna put it away until she's a teeny tiny bit bigger. And then she can have it and wear it um, like a scarf. So uh, that was February's Fiber Club, which was Superwash Targi spun as um, singles. I never did do a, whip, a wraps per inch on it to see exactly what it was, but it knit up on, this These this was knit up on um, six millimeter needles. And I think it was about a sport in the end, like it was knitting as a sport on, uh, on big needles. And I did it on such big needles because of the slip stitches, because I knew that they would be very tight otherwise. And I wanted it to really open up when I washed it, which it did. So um, yeah, it's about a sport weight. And uh, I had 280 yards roughly of this yarn. And I actually have one full color repeat left, which I did intentionally because I really wanted it as a small little sample skein to be able to compare, like this is what the yarn was and what I started with and this is what I ended with. So um, yeah, that that I'm really happy with it. But like I said, they're not my colors and it's, it's not, and therefore it's not for me. But um, it was a really neat experiment and I really enjoyed working with the yarn. Um, sometimes I sort of felt like the yarn was gonna break, like I was a bit worried about durability and already like fingering it and playing with it and taking photos of it and stuff, it's getting a bit of a fuzz. Um, there's they're singles, there's nothing, there's no, there's nothing there and I couldn't fold them because they're super washed. So there's no, um, there's nothing to protect the yarn if you will. So it'll be really interesting once it's Nora's and once she's old enough and if she does wear it, um, to see how it wears. and. I thought what I would do is just sort of keep checking it and um, share how it's standing up with you guys. My next hand spun project that I finished was cast off one afternoon when we were driving up to Manning Park, which is in the interior of British Columbia. It's in the southern part of BC and from here it's a two hour drive. Um, and we go there to go snowshoeing because we can take the dogs. There's no restrictions on having dogs on the snowshoe trails. And um, there's usually tons of snow so the kids can really play. Whereas on the local mountains, um, you're not allowed to have dogs because people don't want to snowshoe on dog poo apparently. Fair enough. And um, if the kids are kind of going in two different directions, it's really hard to sort of confine them because they don't want you hiking up on like the sides of the trail, whereas at Manning, it's sort of, it's a bit more rural, it's more open, it's, um, there's a couple of trails that are real like trails, but there's a couple of places where you're just kind of trudging across the lakes. So um, it's a lot easier for us to go out there and we love the drive. So I cast this off while we were driving um, because round trip, it's four hours, so I got a lot done on it. Um, I made a mistake. <laughs> I can't believe I made a mistake on it. Um, I'll show you. You can't see it, but I just, in all my years of knitting, like I've been knitting for a very long time. I am not a novice knitter. And um, yeah, I made, a, I made a mistake. So anyways, um, I'm gonna insert a couple photos here. You can see what the yarn looked like. These were textured bats that I had made off of my drum carter. I had mixed together Merino, Coriadale, um, cream, undyed alpaca, Firestar, Perindale, Superwash Merino, I already said Merino, um, and Silk. Um, so it was sort of a dog's breakfast that I put in there. Um, you can see underneath here, 
This is my fiber box, which I'm gonna bring out later and show you. And I pretty much just kept digging through that and finding stuff. My original plan, um, I made initially four ounces of bats and then I broke them down into little nests and little fiber nests. And my initial thought was to list them in the, in the Etsy shop, but then I started spinning them and I fell in love and I spun the whole batch and then I made more. So I ended up with a total of about eight ounces of fiber and I ended up with a thousand yards of yarn. It was a two ply um, light fingering. I spun this last summer, so um, it's going to be a while ago now. And um, I just, nothing was working in terms of the projects that I was trying with this yarn and you'll understand why in a minute. Um, so here are some photos of what the initial fiber looked like in the little battlings, um, what the yarn looked like, and then some photos of the finished object and then I'll chat about it. Okay, I love this. <laughs> this, okay, my um, Annie Roden shawl that I knit that was the Snoqualmie Valley, stories is from the Snoqualmie Valley mystery cow um, that I finished back in January um, with the cable and lace pattern and then it had the, the short row garter stitch ridges to finish off the shawl and it was I did that in um, bats that I made off my drum carter that were a combination of um, natural undyed BFL and creamy natural undyed alpaca and it was an 85 20 85 15 percent or yeah 85 15 percent blend um I love that I actually haven't worn it yet um, full disclosure it's a bit hard to wear because it's quite long so it wears more like a scarf and when I'm with the kids and I'm playing with them during the week and whatnot it I just don't I can't wear something like that and I don't wear a lot of my scarves and a lot of my shawls and stuff during the week when I'm with the kids unless we're going somewhere and I don't wear that kind of stuff to the pool um, and the few times that I have put it on, I've actually like wished that I could just, that I was going somewhere a bit dressier where I could wear it around the back of my shoulders. So sort of more like a traditional shawl. Um, and we used to have theater tickets and we go every month. And when the kids were born, we just couldn't keep doing that. So I'm really looking forward to using some of that, that, that knit in particular, and also some of my other shawls when we, when the kids are a bit older and we're able to start doing that again. Um, so, the reason why I'm telling you all this is because that to me was just the epitome of yarn design and pattern choice and the marrying of the two and it just all fit together so beautifully. And this is plainer and it was simpler and it rivals it for, for me. Um, I just love this. <laughs> so it is striping because it is um it was bats it is huge i'm gonna move my chair sorry for the noise um it's huge i wanted it to be like a blanket shawl which i think i had told you guys so i just kind of kept knitting until i realized that if i knit any more and if i kept knitting it that it would be so huge that i actually wouldn't be able to wear it um, because you know this stuff does kind of get a bit unruly if it gets too big but this is what it looks like and uh, yeah it's humongous and I love it <laughs> um, it has a huge garter stitch a garter ridge so the garter ridge starts here and it goes all the way up to here so it's quite long um, my mistake was that I actually I can't believe I did this I actually dropped a stitch um, I dropped it in the garter ridge and the funny thing is is that while I was knitting I actually thought to myself I think I dropped a stitch and I stopped and I looked at my knitting and I, I couldn't see anything and we were in the car and we were chatting about some like life decision-making kind of stuff 
and um, I didn't, I, I just didn't inspect it enough. And sure enough, after I had washed it and after it was blocking, there was a huge hole and I had dropped the stitch. And of course, when you know it, now I can't find it. So I think that's a good thing, right? That I can't find it. Um, oh, here it is. Yeah, so it's in here and it's right there where my middle finger is. So it's a bit of a mistake. I wove in um, the I wove in the stitch to um, to secure it, um, but unfortunately, um, I, I just couldn't believe I did that. Um, there's some places where there's the fire star, and it's just really, really, really pretty. Um, the colors. Oh, the sun's coming out. Um, the the colors are all analogous like it's there's no um there's no red in here so it's all greens blues and yellows and then of course the white and the cream um while i was spinning i actually started um i did actually put in a little bit of black um and you can see it um in some of these really marled areas um and i i'm kind of glad that i did that because it adds a lot of depth um, and then there's in the garter ridge at the end, there's quite a bit of marling that was what I didn't like about the folded squares cardigan. And uh, in this, it turned out really well because I tried to save the part of the skein that I knew was really marled um, for the, the top part. So the, the stockinette stitch up here is more marled and then the garter stitch is a little bit more solid. Um, I blocked it to within an inch of its life as well. Um, it's, and like you can see, as you can see, it's, it's huge. It's enormous. It doesn't even fit. I think this alone, the point is longer than my wingspan. Yeah. So the point go. <laughs> so actually the cool thing though, Jenny does this on the tiny paper foxes podcast. Sometimes she'll wear, especially her bonbon shawl. I think she's done it with her bonbon shawl and I feel like she's done it with other shawls too. She's folded it in half and then she wraps it around like that. And I've actually started doing that with these bigger shawls because I find that they fit under my jacket a lot better. And then when I get wherever we are, if I wanna keep wearing it or if it gets cool, um, I can pull it off and sort of put it on more like a shawl um, and if I don't want to keep it on I I leave it folded up and I put it with our jackets and stuff so it actually like I mean it's just great it's huge and it's wonderful and yeah so and it's my colors I wear these colors anybody who knows me in real life these are pretty much the only colors I wear so <laughs> um, Although I have started wearing a little bit of purple and I am knitting a purple cardigan out of some Cascade 220 right now that I'm really enjoying. So yeah, so this, I'm so happy with this. It turned out just exactly how I had envisioned. This was the vanilla shawl that I was knitting with my dear friend whose aunt just passed away and who was going back and forth on the ferry locally. Hers is finished as well and it turned out beautifully. Um, the way that we made our shawls was we did garter tab cast ons um, of I did six stitch uh, three stitches for mine so that I would have a three stitch garter tab because I was working on 2.75 millimeter needles um, so quite small and my yarn was a heavy fingering um, and in places it was a light fingering and in places it was a sport weight um, not super super consistent but once you wash your hand spun it all goes away it all just magically is fixed and even and looks awesome. Um, she So we did our garter stitch uh, tabs and then we picked up stitches um, and I think I picked up, so I had my three on each side for my garter tab and then I had one, two, three, I think I picked up five stitches, so two, yeah, two to start the right side, two to start the left side and then one center stitch and then we just did on the right side, we did knit two, knit, I did knit three, make one left, knit to the center stitch, make one right, 
center stitch, make one left, knit to the garter tab, make one left. It might be the opposite for my make ones. I'll check my notes. And then knit three for the garter tab. And then on the wrong side, it was knit three, purl across, knit three. So it's really easy. I'll write up. When I, when I do the blog post on this, I'll write up the pattern because it was so super stinking easy. And then when I got to a point where I was sort of sick of doing the stockinette, I just couldn't do it anymore. I switched to the garter ridge and I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 garter ridges. Um, so 36 rows of garter and I cast off on the right side row. Um, on my last right side row. And I again did the stretchy bind off that I mentioned earlier that I did on the other shawl. So that was this. I just, oh, I just, I just love it. <laughs> so um, I don't want it to get caught on any of the fiber tools I'm gonna talk about later. So I am gonna take it off, but um, I was just so, so happy with how this turned out. And uh, yeah, I just, I just love it. The other thing that I finished this week was a skein of hand spun. It is more singles. Surprise, surprise. This is Sweet Georgie Yarns in the tumbled stone colorway. This is Polworth and Silk. And I spun it on my jumbo flyer on my matchless. I spun it at four and a half to one for the ratio. I have an extra super slow whirl now because I picked one up from Penelope Fiber Arts, which is a local um, shop. And I actually spun it, this was Deep Deep Stash, I've had this for years. Um, after I spun my bourbon, which I showed you guys last week, I noticed that there were these grays um, in here. And I had mentioned to you guys about possibly um, seeing if, if my Deep Stashed fiber matched the um, color of, that was in there. And it does, it just looks awesome together. So I am gonna do a daybreak shawl. I did spin this ever so slightly finer than I spun this um, because I realized that um, I needed more yardage. So I have enough yardage in the bourbon for the bottom part of the daybreak shawl um, by Stephen West, but I needed a little bit more for the top part that's the solid. So yeah, that's what these will be. And when I am finished my current sweater that I'm knitting, I will start this and try and finish my succulent shawl and then focus on this. So I am gonna let myself cast it on, but I'm gonna focus on getting my succulent shawl done. So I ended up with, um, I think I ended up with 350 yards of this after washing and I did full this. I put it in boiling hot water, ice cold water, boiling hot water, ice cold water. And actually after I'd done it a few times and I looked at it, I was a bit worried that I had actually done it too much because the strands were all sticking together. But now that it's completely dry, it's totally fine. So that is that. Oh, the bourbon just fell on the ground. It just escaped. The last thing that I wanted to show you, and this is gonna be really, really fast because I've shown this before, is my superwash wool that I've been working on for socks. I dyed, speckle dyed this back in November. This was from Louette North America, and actually they don't sell this particular fiber anymore. It's not listed on the website. I've only done the first bobbin on my hands, and this has been my waiting for the water to boil, um, standing at the stove kind of spin. And uh, this is only the first bobbin. I have started the second bobbin. I've gone through two of my little nests of fiber and I've got, <coughs> excuse me, four more prepped and ready to go. And then I'll keep breaking this down until I'm through it. And then the third bobbin. So I'm doing three bobbins for these socks. Incredibly high twist singles and then super high twist uh, plying because otherwise they just won't stand up. Um, already the, like the fiber is incredibly soft. It's a little bit fly away. Um, it's just not going to have the strength otherwise to withstand being socks. So, and I dyed this to be socks to see how the speckle dye would look in socks. So I want to, I want to follow through on that. So I'm just slowly plugging away at that. I'm still working on my Sweet George Yarns, um, Pacific Spirit 
and uh, that is for the Zero to Hero Spackle. My hair got all messed up from the shawl. Um, I'm still working on it. I've actually, it's been on hold. I'm using my Lendrum as my teaching wheel right now, and so I'm not kind of keeping any big projects on it. Um, but I, I am gonna get started on it again in April after um, this particular course is done and um, I can set my Lendrum up and kind of leave it on there. My West Coast Carding and Color Falkland is still on the go. I My new rule is that every time I finish a project, I need to do a bobbin of Falkland and actually I've been really enjoying that because it gives me a good break in between. The problem is now I have to do the Fiber Club for Sweet Georgia for March and so I have to just even though I finished this and technically I should do a Bob and a Falkland, I can't. I need to keep going and do the um, the March Fiber Club. So my plan is after the March Fiber Club is done, I'm going to try and do two bobbins of the Falkland. And then I'll be able to ply that up and I'll have another skein done. So that'll be kind of nice. Um, and my succulent shawl is still on the needles. I'm hoping that after I finish my uh, cardigan that I will be able to work on that exclusively and get that finished. So... Uh, Cause actually I kind of, I want to wear it. Like I've, um, yeah, I want to wear it. <laughs> so that's that. All right, we are going to move on to um, wool tools and um, blending tools and whatnot. So for those of you who aren't interested in that, um, I hope you enjoyed the show. I'm sorry it was a bit longer this time, but um, I hope that you enjoyed it and I will see you soon. For those of you who want to stick around, I thought that the question that I got in the Ravelry group was, it, there's been a few questions, so I'll kind of blend them all together and, and kind of give you a rundown on, on what they all were. Basically, people have been asking about what drum carter I have, um, and do I use my fiber tools very much, and what do I use them for, and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages to buying a certain tool over another tool. So basically, my advice and take this with a grain of salt but my advice would be to figure out when you look at your spinning and when you look at the, the projects that you enjoy knitting and weaving if that's your choice or crochet um, figure out what the projects are that you make out of your hand spun that you like the most because sometimes that can inform your choice more so than just oh I like this type of yarn or oh I like doing this type of fiber prep because if you're not going to use the finished yarn or the effort to get from the fiber all the way to the finished project is too much work and you're not going to do it then it's probably not worth it to buy that fiber tool prep tool if you can maybe send that particular fleece that you want to get combed off to be pin drafted um, and maybe instead you buy something else for a type of fiber prep that you would do all the time at home, just as an example. Um, so, and vice versa, if you don't like carding, then maybe you send off some fleece to get uh, made into roving while you buy combs because you really love combing. Um, or you don't wanna do any of that and you don't wanna process any of your raw fleece, but you really love colored already dyed top or you want to dye your own top and you want to create poonies and roll eggs and bats and nests and all that kind of stuff. So I would really encourage you to figure out what the fiber prep you enjoy that matches the finished projects that you love the most, that you wear the most, that you use the most, that you weave with the most, whatever finished looks like for you. So for me, after using my blending board quite a bit and after using my hand cards quite a bit, I realized that my favorite finished objects are always my projects that are carded. So that's why I bought a drum carder. Um, I bought a brother drum carder. I've really liked it. It's been a great tool. It wasn't super expensive at that time. Our dollar in Canada was a lot better, so I did get it for a good price. Brother is located in Oregon, so you are paying U.S. pricing. And for us for in Canada, our dollar is so poor right now that um, that can be very expensive. Um, I know lots of people with Ashford drum carters and have been very happy with them. If you are local to Vancouver, Patrick Green out in Chilliwack makes beautiful uh, drum carters. They're expensive. Um, so when it comes to drum carters, I'm not going to show mine. Um, I've had video before of my drum carter and I can slot some in at the end here if you would like, like for you to see sort of what it looks like in action. But um, 
think about when you're ordering there's lots and lots of different carding cloth out there now there isn't just 72 times per inch which I'll explain in a minute anymore there's lots and lots of different carding cloths so I would encourage you to think about what kind of fiber and wool and um, that you're going to be putting on your drum carter before you purchase just any old drum carter if you're going to be working with finer wools the majority of the time you probably want to get a drum carter that can do finer wools so 120 tpi 150 tpi that's getting a bit high but if you're only going to do merino it might be something to think about cotton you need to get high as well 180 tpi 190 um and then your liquor in brush um on a drum carter, you've got your big drum and then you've got the little drum at the front. That's called your liquor in brush. It's always a slightly higher TPI than your drum because otherwise the fiber won't actually lay onto your drum and stay stuck. Your liquor in brush will keep pulling it off. Um, so for mine, for example, I have a 120 TPI carding cloth on my drum and my liquor in brush, my little tiny one, is only 90. And I find that the majority of my fiber, unless I'm loading my, my drum carter down too much, the majority goes on my drum no problem and I can pull off smooth bats because it says finer TPI so when I pull my bats off of the drum carter I kind of give them a gentle tug to draft them a little bit and then turn the drum a bit more pull a bit more off tug it a bit and you end up with these really lovely smooth bats that come off but for me that's what I want I want to usually when I'm working with a carded prep I want to spin semi woolen not fully woolen I don't necessarily always do long backwards draw just because I'm working with a carded prep um so that for drum carters you have to sort of figure out how much you want to spend um how much what what types of fiber you're going to be doing the majority of the time and what types of bats you want if you want to make crazy art bats you probably need to look at <coughs> um something like the wild carter from ashford so something that's a bit coarser with really big thick tines that come out that are quite long um, so that you can get all of that stuff, the silicon oil, the um, sorry silk, the fire star, the different types of fiber, all the different stuff that you want to jam into an art bat. Um, that's something to think about. And art bats tend to grow, so they tend to have narrower drums so that when you pull them off, they kind of fluff up and become bigger. All of the fiber and bits are getting into my nose is making me want to sneeze so I'll, I'll keep going with carding for just just a minute um so for carding i think one of the tools that you sort of can't go wrong with if you want to get something and you want to get going with something that are affordable and under a hundred dollars um, are hand cards so these are ashford hand cards they have a curved back and rounded handles the student hand cards by Ashford have flat handles and if you're going to be doing a lot of carding um, you want to get rounded handles because your hands are going to get quite sore when you have the flat the flat handles so make sure that they're rounded make sure you've got rounded backs and then when you're doing your carding it's a little bit easier to move them um, it's not so um, labor intensive and it doesn't hurt your hands um, in Canada, these are about, after taxes, they're just shy of $100. Um, they come unfinished and you can stain them yourself or paint them, do whatever you want with them. I haven't done anything with mine yet. And then you just need to learn how to load them and charge them properly and then how to transfer them and then, um, you know, how to flip them around and switch hands. It takes practice. Um, what you create with hand cards is carded preparations. So you can make a bat. They're not huge, but you can make a bat with your hand cards. You can make roll eggs and you can make poonies by using, um, by carding your fiber and then you use little sticks to roll um, up a poonie and then you can pull that off. Do your next one, pull that off. I can usually get three poonies per off of my hand cards usually about three three or four I've seen people get five or six it depends how much you charge your hand cards by charging I mean how much you load onto them um, you can blend fibers with your hand cards so if you want to blend um, colors and make um, blended roll eggs blended little bats blended little poonies you can do that on on these um, and yeah you can kind of do everything with these without spending an arm and a leg 
Um, they can be heavy if you've got shoulder problems. They can be a bit of a problem. Like I have to really be in the right um, ergonomic um, position to use them. Um, but yeah, and they're pretty standard at 120 uh, at 72 TPI. Um, you can get cotton cards that I think can come in 120 or 150. So if you know you're going to be only doing fine fiber, you might want to think about that. Schacht makes hand cards as well, and so does Louet. Um, Leclerc, who else makes hand cards? I can't, the name is just escaping me. They're a big, big company. Some of you are probably like yelling at the screen. Sounds like Schacht. It'll come to me. Anyways, there's lots out there. Uh, the Woolery, not necessarily to buy them from the Woolery, but to look at all the different hand cards out there is a great um, website to uh, look at, and that's the Woolery.com. So those are hand cards. I'm gonna stick with uh, carded preparations to start with. So hand cards, I've talked about my drum carder already. The next thing that you can, that starts to get, um, so a drum carder, and unless you're doing hand-pulled roving and, or you're doing really smooth bats where you can spin semi-worsted, hand cards and a drum carder are gonna create yarns that are more on the woolen side of the spectrum. So this is a blending board and this is getting into sort of woolen, and then you can also get into semi woolen and also semi worsted with a with a blending board. So a blending board comes in this big box. My Ashford brand. This was a gift from my husband. It looks like this. It's quite big. My cloth on my blending board is 72 TPI. I have the spots on the back where you can put the. Um, um, it's like a stand kind of, so you can stand it on the on the table or you can put it down in your lap. Um, I'm just going to move the box. Um, the big thing with blending boards right now and why they're so popular is because people are making a lot of punies. Um, and I will insert some photos at the end so that you can see what punies are. This is the stand that comes with it and there's um, a screw that goes in as well. And then you load up your blending board and it's kind of like painting. Um, you use a, uh, a blending brush on on the um, on the on the board, and you push you put all the fiber in, and you brush it all down. Um, and then when you're done, you use your dowels and you wrap the fiber around, and you gently pull it off, wrap it, pull it off, wrap it, pull it off completely, and that makes your first puny. And then you work your way up, making more and more punies. You can also roll the whole thing off like a big bat. Um, or you can roll it off and make um, and break the bat down and make roll eggs or you can um, roll it off and make individual little nests. Um, you can pull it off and put it back on again to sort of start to blend it a little bit. Um, I've been told in the past that a blending board is a really lovely bridge between hand cards and um, having a drum carter. I sort of only agreed with that to a certain extent because a drum carter truly does blend your fiber for you. A blending board does to a certain extent, but everything that comes off my blending board has a certain look. Um, but I can spin semi-worsted with it because I can put the fiber on all parallel and all in one direction, and then I can pull it off in a big in a big bat and break it down vertically. And I can spend and I can spin sort of worsted or semi worsted with it and get a very consistent worsted yarn. Um, so that is definitely something to think about. If you want to blend your colors and blend your fibers without actually um, changing too too much of the combed top parallel fibers type preparation. So that is the blending board. And those are, I got mine on sale. Um, I feel like they're roughly, roughly $200, roughly. I got mine for quite a bit less. Um, it was a show sale and it was kind of one of those too good to be trues kind of situations and my husband bought it for me. Um, but I think, yeah, I think they're usually about $200. I know Louette makes one, and I think there's another company that's just started making them as well. Um, do I absolutely have to have a blending board? No, I could let it go, no problem. Um, could I let my hand cards go? 
I don't think so. Would I ever buy another pair? No. Um, now that I have them, I will always have them. My drum carter, though, was worth every penny. And I will say that to the end of the earth. Um, but it was more of an investment and it cost more. And it was something that I thought about for a really long time. The last thing that I have, and actually I would like to get some more and some different types and bigger ones, are, and actually I'd really like to get a hackle, um, are my wool combs. And I use these a lot, and I use them a lot for blending color. Um, and I will often blend my co the colors on my wool combs and then put them on my hand cards or my blending board if I want to turn it into a bat, but I don't necessarily want to get my drum carter out. Um, wool combs are very expensive. Um, they are a big investment. They cost almost as much as a drum carter sometimes, especially if you want to get a stand to, basically the way a stand works is it secures it to a table and then you put your comb in and it secures it and you can work off your comb. Um, mine's not fastened properly. I've got this all mixed up, but basically you can, you put your wool comb on and you have it on a counter and you can work off of it like a hackle. Um, I have just started doing that quite a bit because I find I can get through a lot more fiber a lot faster. Um, and the way that wool combs work, I'll just show you, this is my big fiber box. And this is my box of like odds and ends, bits and pieces, stuff that I've maybe spun most of the braid and then I have a little bit left over. Um, it holds all my like bits and pieces for making bats. Um, it's just kind of my like, yeah, odds and ends, bits and pieces kind of um, box. So if I wanna do blending color with my wool combs, I lash on the comb top. Especially, I like starting with my wool combs sometimes when I've got a lot, like fibers that are all different staple lengths. Um, or if I'm starting with a combination of um, comb top and roving. So I just work my way across. I'm actually not holding these properly. And then you can push up the back to get it to kind of come apart a little bit and get it to um, come off your combs. I know a friend of mine, She's she loves her wool combs and she's got some mini combs and she had sort of a love affair with her combs one summer and that's sort of all she did um, one summer. And uh, I mean, she created some beautiful yarn and blended it all up and spun it on her spindles. And I mean, it's just truly um, an amazing, wool combs are an amazing thing, but they are very labor intensive. So this is what I was talking about. Like if you have an entire fleece and you're gonna be combing it, um, you might wanna think about getting bigger combs or a hackle um, or sending it out to be done. Like if it's just gonna be too much work and you're not gonna do it and the fleece is just gonna sit, um, you, you know, you have to think about that. Like, I, I think it's really important to think about sort of what, what's important to you and how do you want to spend your time, right? And sometimes it's not in our budget to run out and buy three or $400 worth of wool combs, right? You know, to get a few different kinds and get different types. And there's not a lot of opportunity to try this stuff, which is always frustrating. Minor Canadian combs, they're by Robert Hawkins. He is in Ontario. Um, kind of like this purple that this has created. This is really pretty. This is the color of my cardigan that I'm doing right now. If you follow me on Instagram, I post a photo on the weekend. So then it's all blended up and you can spin from that combed top nest. So that is wool combs. 
and they're a big investment. Um, you can only do one thing with them. It, you can only comb. It's not like a drum carter or a blending board or hand cards where you can do a little bit of everything. Um, I was once given some really great advice, I think, in hindsight. Um, I was a beginner at the time and I didn't really know what I wanted to get and I knew that I had a little tiny bit of um, uh, Christmas money to get something um, that my in-laws had, had offered to buy me a, a fiber prep tool uh, for my Christmas gift that year and, and I, um, I was over the moon and I was so excited and I did some research to kind of find out you know what was recommended and I talked to a couple of friends and unanimously everybody said if you're gonna buy one thing and you don't want to spend a lot and you only um, and you don't have a ton of time to do a ton of fiber prep um, hand cards are the way to go you'll always have them um, you will always use them and need them at some point um, and they're definitely something in my in my tool stash that uh, I do come back to again and again I haven't used them as much as I thought that I would now that I have a drum carter and there's kind of a misnomer out there that drum carters are a lot faster than hand cards. I don't think they're any faster, they're just easier on your body. So if that's something that you need to consider, then saving up for a drum carter, if you know that you can't sit there and card a whole bunch of stuff, then that's definitely something to keep in, keep in mind. So I think that's it for tools. Um, if you have any questions or you wanna know anything more, or you wanna know some, of the, some details about anything that I have shared, please um, um, don't hesitate to ask in the episode thread. For episode 18 and uh, I'll be happy to answer and if I can't then hopefully somebody in the group will be able to help us um, I hope you have a wonderful couple of weeks I will chat with you again at the end of the month I will have the sweet Georgia Club spun I hope and I will be able to show that to you and until then happy spinning bye everyone